this is the Sijiro International. I think it's the second event. Second event. And we'll continue to have this uh, like every month. Yeah, that's good. Okay. So um, I am uh, Wang Wuchen, I'm today's host. And we have uh, three speakers here. And I'll briefly introduce each of us, starting from me. Okay. This is me. Um, you can see uh, all my academic records are highlighted in blue. So I was an aerospace, aerospace engineer uh, from uh, National Chang'an University. Uh, that was uh, in 1987. Then uh, after my military service in Air Force, I went to Florida to have my aerospace engineering PhD over there. Okay. The interesting thing is that uh, after that, I went to university to have my master's degree. But you can see I changed field. I changed field from aerospace engineering to computer science. But later I had a chance to work uh, at at and in New Jersey for three years before coming back to Taiwan. And Next uh, uh, is our president, Tang. Uh, he was uh, in civil engineering in National Taiwan University in 1975, then uh, he's an MBA in National Taiwan University. Before he uh, went to the United States, MIT, to have uh, his PhD. And Professor Tang also uh, served as a uh, tenure professor and also visiting visiting professor at the University of Illinois at Hong Kong for Science and Technology. Okay. So, uh, President Tang, you want to say something? Yeah, uh, I taught at Illinois for about 10 years. I also went to Hong Kong for a year, and then I came back to Changgen to be the department head. Okay, but I stayed for only one and a half years, and I went to a national, went to Taida in uh, 1996. Okay. And then after 25 years, and came back. Okay, I don't know why, but somehow <laughs> I just being here. All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay thank you. Okay. Um, so next is uh, Professor Deng Um You can see uh, both me and President Tang. We are having our uh, education background in the last century. All right. <laughs> and these two had their academic uh, experiences in this new century. So uh, it will be interesting to, 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 you know, to have something discussed between us later. And especially that uh, uh, Professor Ger, uh, you can see uh, he has uh, very different experiences, starting from Australia and uh, Poland, then later in Germany, and he also worked as a research associate professor in China. Okay. So, would you like to briefly talk about it? Okay. Uh, thank you, Jim, for inviting me to speak today. Um, President, um, students. <laughs> okay, so, um, don't, as, don't be shy. As you can see, I have a, a quite um, a wide, broad interest, if you like, um, in my academic background. And so, um, hopefully, um, I'll get the time uh, to, to tell you some more about that later. Thank you. All right, thank you. And our next uh, guest is uh, Professor Tsai. Uh, she had uh, her bachelor's degree from Kaohsiung Medical University in Public Health, and later a master's degree also from Kaohsiung Medical University. And, and after that, uh, she went to Pittsburgh. Uh, for her master's degree in Biostat and uh, went to the UK right, for her PhD in epigenetics at uh, King's College in London. Please. Okay, hi everyone. So, as you can see, <laughs> it's, everything's getting better, you know, I promise. <laughs> you probably start low, but you know, everything gets better. Okay, so I, I'm actually quite nervous today, so I have my cheat sheet here, so in case I forgot anything. <laughs> But yes, thank you for coming and thank you for inviting me here. All right, so that's a brief start. And later, um, starting from now, the first one would be, uh, uh, we would like to, you to share your decision-making process when you decided to study overseas. 
and under what kind of background and why did you do that? Okay, so um, is it in time? You want to begin? Okay, uh, that was uh, why I went to I went to MIT in 1979. The background is I was at uh, at Taida uh, during the during my college years. At that time, at Taida, it was la 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 Taida, chu 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 chu, Meiguo. In the 1960s, because of the uh, space program in the U.S., so the U.S. offered a lot of scholarships to uh, overseas students. So in the 1960s and early 70s, I think two thirds of uh, National Taiwan University graduates. Went to went to U.S. So at that time, you know, uh, very uh, it's not that it's not too difficult to make a decision to go to overseas because all my classmates did not all. I'm sorry. At that time, one third of my classmates went to the U.S. Okay, uh, and back to the civil engineering classes, and then so after a master degree, at that time that was 1979, uh, it was a recession. So it's not easy to find a job in Taiwan, okay? And also at that time, you know, uh, I was uh, amazed by my professor. There was a professor who taught us case studies. Oh, you see, he, he's like a commander. Uh, you say this, and uh, you say that, and uh, summarize this, summarize that. I was, oh yeah, to be that kind of professor is going to be great for my life, okay? So I said, okay, at that time I say, okay, let me, uh, let me go to the U.S. So that's how I decided to go to the U.S. So after, I des after deciding to go to the U.S., uh, the, the second year of my master program, uh, I decided to look, and then I look around, okay? And the rule, golden, golden one, uh, one golden rule is that go to the best school you can in the PhD program. So even though at that time, other schools like Michigan Northwestern, they also offered me full scholarship. I decided not to get there. I decided to take a, a partial scholarship to MIT. I remember at that time, my monthly stipend was 200 US dollars, okay? What does that mean? You spend $100 for your rent, and then you have only $3 a day <laughs> to finish your meal, all right? Ah, that was a very, very poor at that time, okay? Okay, so, then after going to the U.S., um, and no, you, you can find ways to, uh, to, to, to feed yourself because the U.S. universities have a lot of money. So they offer scholarships, all kinds of scholarships, uh, research assistantship, teaching assistantship. It, it's, it's easy. It's easy to find a job in the U.S., okay, even though they don't offer you scholarship. So, but also the U.S. is very, very big country and also they fulfill a lot of opportunities a lot more than you can imagine at that time because I mean the uh, your PhD so I'm also looking for jobs in the industry and also at the academics okay at that time because you are you're from Taiwan so your English is not up to to the US level and therefore uh, I, I have to look for a research oriented university that's how I end up with Illinois. Illinois is in the middle of nowhere. Uh, I have nothing to do but to do research. Okay, so I went there, I got my tenure there. Go to overseas, it will open your eyes and you really don't know what kind of opportunities you're going to face because unlike Taiwan, either in the US or Europe or any other developed countries, there are plenty of opportunities for you to exploit as long as you are competent, okay? You always can find a very, very nice place for you. Right, thank you. Um, looks like uh, that already confirmed our uh, lot of questions that, that you do. You will say you have fulfilled, right? Yeah. Right. Okay. So, Professor Wu? I prepared some structured um, answers because um, uh, although I'm a native speaker, I grew up in Australia, but I, I tend to uh, rattle on. So uh, to, to focus on the time I prepared. So I'm just going to read out the key points of what, what I'm, my answer to this question. So, so I want to tell you that um, it's natural uh, to wanting to study abroad. 
Um, we all want to um, change our environment sometime in our career, whether it's for education or for work. Um, so it is entirely okay to make mistakes and try different things. But my advice to you is that you, if you absolutely know what you want in the beginning, right, that is a major head start advantage because I did not know what I want in the beginning. Okay, uh, it, uh, on my CV, right, uh, I spent a long time as an undergraduate student right, trying to figure out what I want to do with my career. Uh, my decision-making process was trying out different uh, university courses, right? I did biology-related subjects, I did um, arts, humanity, and philosophy. Uh, then I took public health and epidemiology subjects. Um, and eventually I found that understanding how disease work attracted me. I want to go deeper, so I decided to try a pre-medicine, right? Um, and then, um, so I started and completed that at the University of Western Australia, okay? So it took me a long time to figure out what I want. Um, then I completed uh, the post-graduate um, medical training in Poland. Um, the reason I wanted, uh, I chose Europe is because um, uh, it was boring in Australia, I want to try different things. Um, and, um, and Europe also attracted attract me because uh, Australia is, um, uh, how do you say, a Commonwealth country. It's like UK, like Canada and stuff. And, and so, um, my, I, I guess from when I was a kid, I was exposed to UK and this you know, you know, uh, English culture. And so I want to go to Europe and experience things. And so, I, uh, however, if you return, uh, 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 and upon completing that degree, my advice to you is that um, if you um, decide to return, if you take the route, uh, the route I took um, to, to study in Poland medicine, if you plan to return to Taiwan to practice, I do not recommend this. But if you stay in Europe, you entirely, you just take a national exam and you can practice everywhere in Europe, including the United Kingdom. It's a recognized license. Um, so, uh, but then uh, I had second thoughts after completing medicine because I did not really enjoy the clinical aspect, like talking to people all day and, um, and, 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 the, and, and uh, talk, talking to sick people, especially. <laughs> but, um, after a long time, it, it weighs down heavily in your heart. Because uh, when a patient dies, you know, you, you feel somehow responsible. And, and um, deep down, I, I thought my personality wasn't uh, very suited um, to, to go a long time in medicine. So I, I, um, I um, tried research, um, pursued a PhD, uh, tried to challenge myself and do something entirely different. Um, because you can do a medical PhD, but I chose uh, to do a broader PhD in biology. This part, I want to tell you that um, with my undergraduate, you know, I did a lot of history, humanities, philosophy, but you combine that with biology, you have something worthy of research. And, and in China at the moment, there's a lot of human fossils. You want to explore human history, you can do that. And so I did that for two years. Um, and now I, I returned to uh, Taiwan, to Tonkin, for example, uh, in Taiwan, there's um, a lack of fossils. So, but then I combined something different, right? I did. Um, I have medical background combined with um, my research experience, so I can continue, um, you know, doing um, things that I enjoyed previously. And so, um, I guess my advice is that I spent a long time searching what I want to do during an undergraduate, um, and um, of course. Um, it didn't give me a head start. I mean, if you think about it in evolution terms, right? It's like being a generalist or a specialist. And, and, and generally, a generalist uh, adapts well when environment changes. So I guess I was a generalist and I could adapt to different you know, challenges and, and, and still uh, pursue things I like. Okay, thank you. All right. And the person's time you're on. Okay, so. Um I had a very different experience like, compared to the previous two professors. So I'm that kind of person. I don't really know what I want to do, but I really know what I don't really want to do. You know, that's the difference, right? So I have a pretty clear cut like, about the things I really don't like. So I just try to avoid those things. 
and then in the end of the day, I still got the things I want. <laughs> so that's a different path. So I do my like um, I major in uh, public health for my undergraduate, and then after graduation, because a lot of my uh, classmates they are like uh, taking the master's degree. So I'm thinking like, okay, I'll just follow the flow. So I did like an ethnology as my master's degree. And after graduation, I actually spent two years time like uh, working in the wild lab, so you know, doing the experiments and doing the Western culture stuff. And I found like, you know, those sales, they die so easy. So <laughs> they are just not my type, you know. It's like, uh, because you need to wake up really early in the morning, you basically just like uh, stick with your lab work. And every time when the timer was beeping, I actually don't know which one related to which of my experiments, so I'm a little bit less like <laughs> during the time. But roughly at the same time, I actually found out myself is really good at numbers. So I can, I can just totally like uh, relate it to what it means, and then I can pick up things like really fast. I like, I really love to solve problems, and then I like making tables and figures, and I love computer work. <laughs> so everything far away from them is good. And then, so I'm thinking like, okay, I should do something, you know, in a related field, and that's actually the time I think like maybe I can do biostatistics. It's a long term, so it's statistics plus bio. <laughs> and for this type of like um, uh, subject, I think a good advantage of this is because I heard from my friends like you can make a lot of money <laughs> in the United States if you got this three. So actually that's my motivation. You know? It's sort of like a very practical reason like why I choose this subject. So I started like uh, apply and then the time I actually applied um, in the United States. So in the end, I get into the uh, University of Pittsburgh. And during that time, I actually found like, um, so you know, like statistics and the math, they are totally different ideas. So I'm really bad at formulas, probabilities, all this, this kind of distribution stuff, I'm really bad at. But I'm good at like uh, um, statistical methods. And I'm really good in analyzing data. So actually, that's the that's the time I actually found that I have this talent, you know. I skip a lot of courses, but I still got like, you know, eight plus score <laughs> on those classes. So I was thinking like, okay, I should do something in this field. But also at the same time, I really don't like um, the whole uh, environment, like in my school. So by the time I was thinking like I should just go abroad and I found um, UK, the UK system is actually very special. You don't have to take any courses. So that means no exams. Blah. That's right. So, you know, so that's the thing. I was like, yeah, okay, this is the place I want to go. So that's the main reason like why I apply like uh, my PhD in UK. And then sort of like when I'm looking back, so that's the second question, right? So when I'm looking back, everything's good. Like I got my master's degrees and PhD degrees successfully. So that's sort of like a fulfilled my plans. The only thing is probably the money part, you know, <laughs> stay in the academia. <laughs> it's definitely not like, you know, because originally I was planning to go like the pharmaceutical companies after I got a degree. So that's the plan B. <laughs> and now I, I'm happy, so it's good. Yeah, yeah it's good that everybody is happy right now. <laughs> Um, so you can see the exploration process to make this decision actually is not that straightforward. That sometimes you need to try a lot in order to understand what you like or in order to understand what you try to avoid, like the perfect title. And uh, um, so that's pretty much the first question we uh, like to ask. The next one is um, why and uh, how you decide the country you want to go. Uh, I think probably all of you have partially answered that question already, but uh, if you have anything to add, uh, it's time that uh, you can do um, why you make this uh, choice. Is it based on ranking or is it based on your interest? Uh, Professor Tan, you want to? Okay, at that time, how would you decide the country to get your PhD? Uh, it, at that time, in 1979, uh, I don't think at that time that Europe was uh, was ready to be a research uh, research universities. Okay, at that time, I think everybody talk about the ranking. I was in the business school. In business school, uh, I think very few European schools are in the rank of the worldwide 
uh, ranking on, on business schools. So at that time, I got no choice uh, but, to go to the, but to go to the US, okay? But if you were in the business school, uh, you want to apply for a PhD program, my recommendation is that still, I'm sorry, okay, still go to the US. Okay? <laughs> why, okay, why? US is much more structured program, okay? Uh, unlike the UK, you know, you, know, you smoke your pipeline, you know, smoke the pipe, and you get a PhD. But not in the US. The US is very structured. You have got to have uh, required courses. You've got elective courses. You've got to have a major. You've got to have a minor. You have to pass the prelim. You have to pass the thesis examination. Okay? There's a, a fixed program that you have to go to. And therefore, for the US pitch program, they have a much better quality control. Much better quality control. Because when I was in, the U, in, the, in, when I was in Illinois, we hire a bunch of PhDs. Uh, I'm sorry, for European PhDs, at the beginning, the looks so shiny. Okay, good creative skills and good this and good that, but the base on the on, on the basic training, discipline training, they are not as good as US PhDs. That was my maybe that was my bias twenty years ago. Okay, when I was uh, when I was in Illinois. So if I were you, uh, still the US has a has a better quality control. All right, the ranking, as I told you, you want to get a PhD, there's no choice. Go to the best school you can. Still, I think the best is still the golden rule. Okay, because a PhD is a terminal degree. It's the last degree you will get for the rest of your life. All right? Uh, so so for, the, for the second question, right, uh, uh, was it according to university ranking or your research interest? I think that my answer for this is no. Um, there are many factors that can influence your decision, not only university rank, right? Apart from um, choosing the university, perhaps it's more practical to think why the university should choose you, um, and what you have, what have you got to offer, right? After graduation, students who cannot find, often find a fulfilling um, or satisfying point, or often, most likely, to consider further study, especially those who have financial support from their families. Um, so my advice for you in, uh, for this question uh, to apply for PhD, what are the strategies you can do? Uh, it possibly falls under three plans. So plan A is uh, what President Tom said. It's the hardest way, brute force. It's the front door, right? Build an attractive resume or CV. Uh, that means you have to get the best grades possible um, at your university, you have to keep, try to get to the best university in your country. You have to get good recommendation letter from someone respected in the field of study. Um, you have to be very proficient at the requirement uh, of a lab, whether you're interested in a wet lab, so it's like a special skill, doing PCR, for example, or a dry lab, you know, programming lab, which we're talking about. So you need to know um, how to sell yourself um, in plan A. Um, but, but I have prepared for you other plans. Um, plan B, um, there's no guarantee, but you can try this. Um, you can try to use relationships to advantage. Like, and that means if you know a friend of a friend or a relative who's working at someone's lab um, to recommend you. Um, or I, I often find this one um, is possible to do, is to attend international conferences. Um, you know, small academic circles will tend to attend the same conference. And so, what's your mission at that conference? Basically, to find, uh, have a chat with a supervisor that you're interested in, and just ask them if it's possible to do a student exchange or like a summer internship at their lab. And um, in doing so, you build trust with them, and you actually find out is it, is it what you uh, expected, or is it, is it live up to your anticipation? And you can more accurately um, make your decision after that. Okay, and then, and then there's a plan C. So plan C, plan C, I've, it's an alternative way. It's not, a, it's not the front door, but it's the back door. Okay, yeah, um, often, um, as I, I mentioned um, in my answer to the previous question, I, I provided, see, I provided human samples for research. So I have the research material. Often these are, um, precious material, uh, perhaps difficult to get. 
Um, and, and, and if the supervisor is interested and he has funding for you, uh, perhaps you'll consider it. And the other thing is if you're self-funded. Uh, for example, in Europe, I know there's an Erasmus um, program that is designed for use. Um, and it's basically scholarships that enable you um, to do, uh, to, well, to just experience what the research opportunity is. So, um, so Plan C is about, you know, um, whether you have uh, a research material or you're sufficiently self-funded yourself. So, so, I mean, you basically take the pressure off the supervisor having to. And so it's really down to whether he has time or whether he or her have time to train. All right, it's turn uh, <laughs> to you, Kate, and you also have your experience, so maybe yeah. you can do some comparison. Okay, just for the record, all of us, four of us, we support you, I would say, okay? <laughs> <laughs> just do your PhD, I would Just let me explain how you why is that? So, just like uh, President Tom said, so you know, everything in the United States is like well structured. So, you know, like you need to take the courses first, and you need to have the fundamental knowledge first, and then they sort of like teaching you how to do a research step by step. And then you are just like, you will be um, evaluated, like they will be qualified exams, either for your subjects and also for your presentations. And then so everything is sort of like, you know in a formal way. But if you really like, uh, just like, you know, I'll take myself as an example, like why I choose to um, do my PhD in the UK is because by the time I saw it, <laughs> I already have enough like, knowledge. And I really want to directly, uh, you know, doing the research because, okay, the first thing like, I also started my PhD really late. So I'm probably like, you know, 29 or 30 years old. And I have like you know world experience like already, and I and I think like you know the key point is if you think you can like you know self study like really well, then UK probably will be a choice because I still remember my first year in the UK. They have just so many things I need to catch up with, so I just like learn a lot of things because they are not so sort of, like you know formal training. For the things I need. So I just like took a lot of courses. I sit in the courses, although they are not like exams, which is good. I still like learn a lot of things. And then we got like a sort of an upgrade exam like uh, at the end of the first year. So this set of like exams pretty crazy. It's just like you and um, all your committee members. So there's no limits about their questions. They can ask anything they want. So it's sort of like a big one. If you fail this one, you will become like a master student or you just like directly go on. So I guess like, you know, that's a different pressure, like uh, when you apply the two different tracks. And the reason why I do it is another important one is because it's usually like it take four years uh, for the PhD study like in the United Kingdom. And I really like this kind of clear cut because I'm that kind of person. If you don't tell me to stop, I will just keep going on and on and on. So I probably will take my PhD like, you know, for 10 years because I just don't know like, when to finish. So for the uni one, I think it's good because for the four years, they just, the school will tell you, like, you know, if you can't finish like, in four years, they will just kick you out. So you don't get, you get nothing, basically. So that's kind of scary, right? So it actually like, you know, <laughs> makes me think, like, okay, I need to do this, I need to finish like, it. By time and then, so that's the things I really like about the UK. But I agree, like you know, if you want to, if you don't think yourself is got like fully trained, like you know, with other resources, then like you know, USA is probably better, like in general. So how I found my interview is actually another interesting story. So um, I want to do uh, statistical genetics as my major, but it's really funny because you really can't find any department called statistical genetics. So usually there are like you know some staff doing uh, statistical genetics in the department of biostatistics or under uh, you know human genetics department. But there is no such like a specific uh, department where I can apply for. So it really takes me a long time to find the proper one because I need to get on the website and check all the expertise for each member in that department. And just when I feel like, you know, I'm really hopeless, Albert actually like recommend me a website. It's called 
findaphd.com. <laughs> Very straightforward. And there's another like you know, website called findamaster.com. So you guys should check it. So this one is just like a PhD bank, like a post bank. So uh, your future supervisor, they will just like uh, put the post on the website and then they will say what kind of students they are looking for, uh, what's the project like of your PhD study, and um, whether they are like a scholarship on, uh, on this position and uh, all the other details. So I found this like you know, specific, like the PhD is doing like epigenetic research on twins. So you actually like a I feel myself really feeling that position, and that's the things I'm really interested in doing because it's just like purely study of genetics. So I applied for that one, and that's basically, and luckily, you know, because it's in King's College of London, so that is a really good school, so there's nothing I can complain about. So that's how I found my beauty. This one, I think that one's, this one's important. During COVID 19 pandemic, uh, people are not going anywhere. So how do we still maintain international perspective without going overseas? Uh, let's start with President Tan. Yeah, uh, international perspective. Uh, I think now uh, a lot of radios or news broadcasts are available online. Okay, you, for me, I did tap into Bloomberg.com uh, or Wall Street Journal. They got podcasts every day. So with those international news media, you will be able to get your international perspective. But first, you have got to have a good English at the beginning. Okay, oh, this is a very difficult question. Um, okay, my advice is just keep learning. Um, you have to keep up with the news and the current affairs because um, it will affect what country you can go to after the health sanctions are lifted. Um, and uh, you can consider doing an online course. For example, um, I keep coming back to the European recognize uh, know that better. You can do a one-year master course online, for example, uh, University of Manchester, for example. Um, if you have previous teachers or collaborators, you have to move those meetings online. Um, these are some of the... Um, Okay, he still my answer, so I'll just skip this one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, indeed, there is a lot of uh, online programs available. And uh, nowadays, internet information is actually much more than we had in our time. So uh, I think it's very, uh, very, very good uh, yeah. thing. All right, so let's finish the interview here. Thank you, three, for sharing those experiences with us. Um, thank you.